All right, welcome everybody to today's live stream. And we are gonna be talking about a very important topic that is very hot stream right now. It is a very hot topic, I should say. Many people are interested to know, you know, what is gonna be going on with the Beijing 2022 Winter Olympics. You know, we've seen many countries around the world now have come around and have said that they will be announcing a formal, you know, diplomatic boycott. And the goal with today is, was we're really going to, what I want to do in today's stream is I want to answer a few questions. And what you'll notice today is I am, I am on a green screen. So I just want to be very open with everybody. I am currently traveling right now. I'm in America and I am uh, without my normal equipment. So I'm on a laptop using the webcam. And I am also uh, just found in a quiet room uh, in order to be able to do this live stream tonight. And I wanted to kind of get back in the game here on YouTube as far as my live streams. It's been a while since I've you know seen you guys live. So first of all, welcome everybody back to uh, you know the channel. Uh, for those of you, if this is your first time watching, uh, my name is Cyrus Jansen. I'm an American expat that has lived around the world for the past 15 years, and I'm very excited about the Olympics. I think the Olympics is really one of the most incredible. Uh, sporting events in the world is one of the most incredible events uh, that happens every year around or not every four years around the world. Um, and, and it's really important. You know, I think that, you know, when I, you know, I think many of you know, might know my background is that I am a sportsman. I have spent a lot of time, um, you know, uh, you know, involved in the sports industry, specifically uh, in China. I've worked with the China Olympic Committee. I've, uh, you know, used to work for uh, work with a company called the China Olympic Sport uh, Industry. And, you know, we were doing different golf events all around China. And so it's amazing, you know, how big sports has become in China. And this was really, you know, started in 2008. You know, this is, you know, really when Beijing hosted the Summer Olympics. That was China's coming out party. You know, that was really their message to the world saying, look, you know, we're going to put on a phenomenal Olympic Games. Uh, Beijing 2008 truly was a world class event. Uh, there were so many great memories from that Olympics. And, you know, it was really a time when the United States and China relations were, were much better. Um, I remember seeing images of George W. Bush uh, in attendance, you know, as he watched Michael Phelps win gold medals, you know, proudly waving the American flag, sitting in the common section, you know, with other fans from around the world, obviously many Chinese included. And I think it was really amazing to see you know, uh, you know, again, when you have all of these athletes and the diplomats together, you know, this is really the world coming together and, you know, embracing something like sport. Now, sport really does have an opportunity to, to transcend a lot of things. I've, I've mentioned this a few times on my channel. I'm going to go ahead and mention it again as we're waiting for more people to come in the stream here. We're just over 100 people here in the stream now. Um, so, again, thank you guys for taking time out of your day. It is uh, 6 p.m. here on the East Coast. I'm back in my hometown of Orlando, Florida, my first visit home in about four years' time. So very happy to be back in Orlando. Um, I'm here for the month of December, actually. So very excited to be back in America, uh, back here on the East Coast. And, <clears throat> you know, there's just a lot of excitement as we are, you know, just two months away. But it's also... There's a China's in the news right now, you know, a lot for a many different things. And, you know, as we go on with this live stream, I want to make sure that, uh, you know, I want to answer all of your questions. I want to, you know, you know, whatever we want to talk about today, obviously the main topic is going to be the Beijing Olympics. Uh, it's going to be this diplomatic boycott. You know, some of the questions that we're going to answer, for example, is, is going to be, you know, will this diplomatic boycott, will this actually hurt China uh, in the long run, you know, is this going to hurt China? Is it going to actually potentially spoil their Olympic Winter Games? Uh, this is a big moment for China as well. You know, this is uh, Beijing will make history. They will become the first city in the world to host both a Summer and Winter Olympics. You're going to hear that quite a lot. Um, you know, this is obviously 2008 was China's coming out party. 2022, you know, as as China continues to grow. Um, you know, its economy, you know, it's, it's, it's still growing. I mean, there's still many opportunities in China. It still, you know, is on track to surpass the United States as the world's largest economy. Now, the interesting thing is, is that 
you know, these last 12 months have been very interesting in China. We've seen um, Xi Jinping, you know, he has really come out, surprised many people, many investors, you know, with these regulations, you know, the tech regulation, the, um, you know, this is a very big trending thing that's been happening. You know, we've seen um, a tremendous amount of, you know, market capitalization in the stock markets and Chinese names has been, you know, wiped out, you know, a lot of, a lot of Chinese names, you know, a lot of these popular Chinese stocks like Alibaba, you know, trading at a very, very low, um, you know, price to earnings ratio, as you compare that to, you know, what it, what it probably should be trading at. And, and certainly even with this China discount, you know, this is something that we've seen a lot of the, the Chinese internet stocks, um, you know, are under a lot of pressure. Um, I think what's really interesting is, is what I feel, and, and, and again, we're, we're going to get into the topics of the Olympics, but, you know, as somebody that studies China, you know, that spends a lot of time trying to analyze the policies and trying to really understand what's coming out of China, a lot of times from the Western perspective, we don't really understand everything because in China, they're very much are planning 5, 10, 15 years down the road. I think an interesting thing is, is when we're talking about tech regulation, for example, you know, we see some of these big problems that are happening in North America with companies like Facebook and, and the fact that these tech companies are largely unregulated. They are now out of control and they're so big that the U.S. government really has no opportunity to have any control on these. And that's something that China, you know, got ahead of very early in the in the stage. I was reading um a tweet from another, uh, you know, from a Chinese expat, I'm sorry, from an expat in China. And he was saying that, you know, um, I believe he's French. I forgot his name. It, it's off the top of my, off of my head, but he had a really, really good thread on Twitter. And he said, you know, the greatest decision that China made was installing that firewall 20 years ago. And the main reason for that was just being able to control you know, the companies that are operating inside of China. For example, you know, if you go to Europe, it's American companies like a Facebook, um, you know, like an Instagram, that, you know, that are dominating and getting all of the data for European companies. You know, they're getting all the data of Europeans. There's no way for a country like France, for example, uh, you know, again, Amazon, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp. I mean, these all are dominated by American companies. Uh, there's not a French equivalent that's going to be, you know, be able to compete with that. Um, and China said, no, we're going to, you know, we want to be basically be able to have, you know, that data. We want to be able to be able to control that. And, you know, we essentially we don't want to be a slave to the American system. And, you know, there's there's definitely some um, benefits to that. There's definitely some negatives to that as well. You know, I'm not going to paint it that this is some perfect system. Um, there's definitely some positives and negatives, uh, you know, in that system. But again, this is what China's done. And, you know, we're seeing a lot of you know, a lot of industries, you know, that are, that are, have been affected over the last, uh, you know, 12, 12 months specifically. Um, interesting side note, you know, I, I mean, this was about six years ago, the golf industry in China was under a heavy attack from the government. There was a tremendous amount of corruption that was going on in the golf industry. Um, China had closed about a hundred golf courses in, in the span of about 12 months. And many people speculated, oh, is China going to ban all the golf in China? You know, and, and there's there's something that, um, you know, people need to understand when we talk about China and we really try to understand this is that, you know, the government does control all of these aspects, you know, whether it's a tech company, whether it is the, you know, the sport, you know, what, whatever that is, you know, the government is going to be controlled. There's no company that can be bigger than the government. And, you know, this is a way that they can control how the country's moving and, you know, hopefully moving in the direction that they want. So I'm still, you know, optimistic on China as far as, you know, we need to zoom out a little bit. We need to see, you know, what is this tech regulation going to be like five to 10 years from now? Sometimes you might have some short term pain for some long term gain. So that, that's that's a little bit of analysis on that. Um, let's go ahead and jump into the main topic here. And first of all, I want to uh, say thank you to everybody for joining. I'm going to go ahead and check the comment section here. And uh, we've got some people from uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Love it. You know, 1996 uh, Summer Olympics in Atlanta. Fantastic. Good morning from Down Under. Uh, testify, Tester, AJ, hello. Kevin James, hello. Everybody, um, thank you guys for joining today. I'm really, I'm really excited. I'm really excited for the show and excited to be um, you know, talking about this, this topic. So let's go ahead and jump in, you know, so obviously it's not news anymore. 
the United States is will be, you know, implementing a diplomatic boycott of Beijing 2022. Now, I think, you know, the United States is really the leader of the Western world, uh, you know, leader of the world, if you want. Um, I think many countries were waiting on the United States to announce this boycott. It was suspected to be coming for a long time, many months. You know, there was you know, speculation that Joe Biden and his staff would be announcing this diplomatic boycott. And, you know, we finally, you know, were able to, you know, see that this week. Now, as soon as the United States announced, you know, as expected, other countries are going to follow suit. You know, we had Australia. Australia had even mentioned, for example, that we're just kind of waiting on the United States. Once they do it, you know, we're going to follow in their footsteps uh, Canada, of course, uh, the United Kingdom, New Zealand. So you've got the five eyes there, you know, all uniting together. I believe New Zealand's actually a little bit more COVID related to their to their boycott, essentially saying like, you know, we're not going to send just because of, of, of COVID, et cetera. Um, however, I think what, um, you know, this, this is an important thing. I, I, I do want to say that because um, you know, I, I think we. I want to talk a little bit about the reactions from China. You know what the United States has said, and you know, you, basically, the diplomatic boycott is an interesting one. And I think if we actually look at the history of the Olympics, um, you know, there, boycotts have been a part of many Olympics. You know, I think the very first boycott was back in 1908 when a group of Irish Olympians, you know, boycotted the event because they didn't want to be represented under the Great British, you know, the Great Britain flag. Um, obviously, the, probably the most notable uh, boycott, which was the 1980 Summer Olympics in Moscow. Um, I believe the United States obviously led that boycott. And that boycott, uh, you know, did have 68 other countries, I believe it was. It was over 60 different countries around the world, followed the United States, boycotted that event. But there was something that really interesting happened there. And this is a precedent for, you know, why I'm bringing this up. Number one, in 1980, when the 68 nations decided to do a full boycott, and that was that they would not even send, you know, their athletes there, what they found out was that essentially it really, it, it really tarnished the Olympic goal. I mean, the goal of the Olympics, the goal is, again, to unite the, the world, you know, to bring to everybody through sport. And, you know, this is a good time for diplomats to meet. And if you're going to have an issue with a country or you want to solve issues, you know, the best thing that you can do is dialogue and engagement. Now, obviously, if no diplomats are there, there's no engagement, there's no diplomacy. So it's hard to really, you know, improve a relationship if you're not there in the first place. You know, that's that's that was really evident. And really, in 1980, it even took it to the next step because none of the athletes went either. And looking back on that, you know, we've had members, you know, American members of the International Olympic Committee say, look, even a, you know, a full boycott, you know, all it really damages is the athletes themselves. You know, that's really the only people that damage it doesn't really affect the games as much. Um, you know, and again, these are athletes that have spent their entire lives, you know, maybe waiting for this one moment in order to, you know, hopefully claim Olympic glory. So, you know, this is one thing that's important. That's why I think you're, you're not seeing a, you know, a full boycott, you know, you are, you are seeing um, the athletes from all of these countries will be going. Um, now, I think, oh, you know, China has come out and they've, they've basically said two things that I think are really interesting. And I kind of want to break them down. Number one, they've said, um, well, you know what, you guys were saying that you were going to boycott it. And guess what? You weren't invited in the first place. Now, I don't really agree with that because I think any time that, you know, as soon as Beijing won the bid to host the Olympics, you know, pretty much that means that all the diplomats from around the world are going to have an open invitation to come to Beijing. I mean, you know, ideally in a perfect world, you know, you would have the United States president or vice president um, you know, and, and, and these other big countries around the world. You want to have these diplomats there. Again, we go back to 2008, Beijing was hosting in the summer. That's a lot of face for China when George Bush is in the stands holding the American flag and, you know, cheering there, sitting in the comment section with many other fans and cheering. That's a good thing. That's a good thing for the world. That's what we want to see. Um, now, then, you know, now, obviously, the big thing that is is really tied to this entire thing is really human rights. And, you know, this is something that we need to address. You know, uh, many I think the United States has officially said that, 
you know, obviously we know uh, Michael Pompeo, for example, on his last day in office, um, officially declared a genocide in Xinjiang. Um, there's there's a lot of speculation, I think, uh, as far as how well documented the evidence is for this. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions on, you know, can we use the term genocide? Again, this is a very, this is a very um, specific term. It is a term that you cannot throw out very casually. Um, you know, an interesting case story would be, an interesting case study would be uh, Turkey and Armenia. You know, for, for um, over almost 100 years, um, the, you know, there was, the United States did not formally recognize that there was a genocide that actually took place in Armenia. And I mean, this is, a t this is something that actually a million people died. I mean, this was a genuine, you know, well-documented, you know, genocide where people were, were, you know, hundreds of hundreds of thousands, you know, I believe it was over a million people that lost their lives. And, you know, the United States did not want to call it a genocide because they didn't want to, you know, offend Turkey. And, and, and it, w it was interesting that it was actually Joe Biden for the first time in American history earlier this year, you know, officially said that that actually was a genocide. But, you know, it's 100 years later. So, I mean, the, obviously the effect is, is um, you know, not as significant. So uh, um, th this is really an interesting thing when we talk about, you know, the definitions, because this is something that is really important. You know, when we say genocide, we're thinking, you know, Nazi, we're thinking Holocaust, we're thinking people that are, um, you know, gas chambers and, you know, an, an extinction of race. And that is something that, you know, is not happening in China as far as the fact that we've seen the population grow in Xinjiang. Um, you know, we, we see that, you know, Uyghur culture, along with many other, you know, um, ethnic minorities is respected, is preserved. The languages are spoken. Um, you know, I've documented this. I mean, we've, we've had many videos of people going to these areas and hearing the local language and things like that. So when, you, when we talk about even a cultural genocide, um, I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's really important to go and get the facts about what is happening and, and, you know, what is really happening on the ground. And it's absolutely imperative that you, you know, spend time in these regions. Um, for example, many of you might follow Sean Ryan um, on Twitter. You know, he has been in China pretty much since, I believe, 1997. Um, Sean and I sat down for a full probably about an hour and 20 minute conversation last week. I'm, I'm, I'm getting that video edited at the moment. And we're going to be talking about that because, for example, one of the interesting things that Sean said is he went to Tibet in 1997. And I believe he went again just this past year in 2021. Or maybe it was, I think he went in 2000, something around there. It was about a 20 year difference from his first and his second visit to Tibet. And the, the key thing that he had expressed was the fact that you know, the amount of poverty alleviation that, that that had gone through and just how poor Tibet was 20 years ago and how much better it has become and how, as a result of that, how much human rights have increased and actually been preserved and actually, you know, been been in, in, improved in Tibet. And that's the side of the story that we never hear. You know, we hear in the West is, you know, Tibet, you know, free Tibet. Uh, well, you know, well, Tibet is actually living, you know, people in Tibet are living you know, their best lives. I mean, they're, you know, Tibet is part of China. They're getting, you know, high speed rails. They're getting the best roads. They're getting great education. They're being able to preserve their local language. You know, these are some really important facts that we need to establish. But here in the West, nobody wants to recognize this. The narrative comes out, well, they're trying to erode the Tibetan language because they're teaching Mandarin in the school. And I've made a very, I've made a whole video on this topic and it's, it's really important. Um, no, you know, when you have a country like China with over 300 different dialects in many cities all over China, you're going to have to have a national language. I think it's absolutely imperative. I mean, I've traveled extensively through China. I've been in parts of China where I've met, you know, villagers that could only speak their local dialect. You know, they could not speak Mandarin. And, and, you know, when you're looking at poverty alleviation, when you're looking at how do we have the best interest of the next generation? Well, if you're from a very small village and you can only speak that small village dialect, you don't have much of a chance, even in China, right? You can't come to Shanghai or Beijing and get a better job. You can't speak the national language. And this is really important for people to understand. 
you know, the fact that, yes, you know, you're going to learn Mandarin because you're Chinese. That is the official language of China. Uh, in addition, you know, you are going to be able to learn that local dialect as well. I mean, we see this, for example, I lived seven years in Shanghai. You know, you know, many locals there, you know, still speak Shanghainese. You know, Shanghainese is, is alive and well. Now, it is slowly fading away. Is it fading away because of the government? Is the government trying to push away Shanghainese? Or is it the fact that just, you know, many second, third, fourth generation Shanghainese children, you know, they're just not, you know, studying the language as much as before. You know, now parents in Shanghai are saying, that's okay. You know, just speak Mandarin. You know, you're fine. You don't need to learn Shanghainese. And that's why you'll see a lot of younger kids, you know, they'll say, I can, I can understand it. I can hear it because my parents and their grandparents speak it, but I don't speak it. My parents said, you know what? Mandarin's fine. You know, just learn that now. So yes, there is some languages that are declining. But again, it's more of a situational base. It's not because the government is coming out saying we need to eradicate every other language. You know, Mandarin is the only one. It is also important to understand, you know, again, you have to have a national language. And that's something that's a nuance that many people around the world don't understand. I mean, here I am in America. I'm in Florida. I can travel to any other of the 50 states and you're going to be able to speak English. No problem. Now, um, Let's go back to the diplomatic boycott, because I think this is an important thing. You know, is, is this, is the, you know, will this hurt China? You know, that's, that's something that I want to say. And I, I think when we look at it from the game perspective, um, you know, for the Olympic Games, at the end of the day, you know, we watch the Olympics to tune in and watch these stories that are unfolding. We watching the Olympics to see the athletes. Um, I can't tell you who was the American diplomat that traveled to Tokyo to attend the 2020 games. I'm, I know that there was somebody from the United States government um, that traveled, but I don't remember because it wasn't really, you know, it wasn't played on TV. It was really all about the athletes. That's what the Olympics is all about. And so it is more of a missed opportunity, I feel, you know, for uh, China and other countries around the world to, again, to have that opportunity and that engagement. Now, I want to give everybody a very clear example of, um, you know, why diplomacy and why engagement is so important. So earlier this year, I'm going to say it was around June of this year, uh, we had, um, what is her name? I forgot her name. Wendy Sherman. We had Wendy Sherman from the United States of America, a very uh, well-established, well-spoken, you, know, uh, you know, foreign diplomat for America. Now, Wendy Sherman, she went out and she flew to Beijing. I'm sorry, she flew to Tianjin, actually. And she was in, and the, the interesting thing with the diplomats is, and this is something I want people to understand, diplomat, you're treated at a different level than a common citizen, right? A diplomat is, has a different area of the airport that they're flying into. A diplomat has a different area where they're getting their passport scanned. Wendy Sherman, when she flies into China, she's not quarantining for 21 days. She's going right to her meeting. She's meeting directly with China government officials, and she's sitting down and doing business. And one of the interesting things that was so fascinating about her visit in June is that, you know, the United States was given a list. They were given a list of things that, you know, in order for this United States and China relationship to improve, here are some things that China is looking for. Now, number one on that list was Meng Wanzhou. And I bring that up because, as many of you know, I'm, I'm actually based full-time in Vancouver. I live there full-time. Um, in addition to being an American citizen, I'm a Canadian permanent resident, so I do make my home in Vancouver. And the thing is, is that the Meng Wanzhou trial had lasted over two years. Um, you know, it was coming up on three years. It was two and a half years when Wendy Sherman took that visit to Tianjin. And, you know, China said, look, you know, we have to resolve this. You know, this has to come to an end. It's been two and a half years. At the end of the day, we need to make a decision. Something has to give, right? And, you know, the United States, they did not have the evidence that they needed to really, you know, go forward with this extradition. You know, and then that, that was the big thing is, is that, you know, there was not any evidence there. You know, the United States was in a position where it really couldn't move it any further. It kind of pushed it for two and a half years. But at the end of the day, Meng Wanzhou walked with a non-guilty verdict. She was not guilty. She was immediately released. And, you know, she boarded a plane and returned back to China. Now, I was very excited about this. I immediately took to YouTube. I made a video. I posted it on my Twitter. And I said, this is progress. And this is a fine example of diplomacy. 
when you have a government official from America sit down with China. And that's an example of America listening to China. Now, it goes both ways. China needs to listen to America as well. And, and you know, but it needs to be in a constructive way and it needs to be in a respectful way because there's certain things, for example, that, you know, we need to be able to understand and really be able to just agree to disagree. Uh, one of these things would be, for example, um, the style of government. You know, for example, a big thing that we always hear is that, you know, America is a democracy and, you know, we want to bring democracy to China. Well, you know what? China is not a democracy. It is a, you know, it is socialism with Chinese characteristics. They have the Communist Party of China. Um, it has been, you know, it's celebrating its 100th year in 2021. You know, like it or not, as an American, that is the official government of China. It is not our job to go in there and change governments. We've done a lot of regime changing around the world. We have overthrown democratically elected governments and then put in a military coup to overtake that because we didn't like who was in charge of that country. We have a long history of doing that. You can check my Twitter. I shared a stream. Uh, I shared a, a thread that kind of highlighted all this. One of the biggest ones for me that I learned firsthand was when I went to Chile in South America. Now, Chile was very interesting because I, I did a tour through Chile and I, I learned about the history of, of American intervention in South America. And at the time, what happened was, is that you had, um, you know, Chile, as many of you know, it's a very, it's a very uh, long and narrow country. So it's very long, and I think it might be the longest country in the world, extremely narrow in some areas. So getting telecommunications was very difficult for Chile in the 1950s and 60s. You know, they had to run telephone poles. And, you know, many of the, most of the country was disconnected. Now, the United States investors, telephone communication companies from America, went in and they installed all of the telecommunication lines in, you know, in, in Chile. And, you know, these were American companies, you know, and they were making a lot of money in Chile. And the government said, look, you know, why are we, you know, outsourcing everything to Americans? You know, this is our job. This is our country. Why don't we take control of these? Why don't we, you know, why don't we build the things that we need? And it's fine if you want to invest and we do a partnership, but for them to 100% own it and to get all of the revenue and, you know, it didn't sit well with, um, you know, Chile's government at the time. And anyways, there was a democratic election and a socialist president came to power. And he said, you know, this is what we need to do. We need to have more income equality. We have very rich people here and a lot of people suffering. We need to have a society that, you know, we need to have, you know, better land rights for, for farmers. We need to, you know, be, you know, we need to be supporting local, you know, we need to be helping each other out. He won the election and, you know, the United States government actually brought in, you know, actually supplied the, the military needs for a coup government to go in, bomb the Capitol building and assassinate the president and then overtake. And I think it was Batista was the man that overtook that government. And Batista ended up being a tyrant. And, you know, the United States couldn't control this guy. And so he then went off for the next 12 years and he just completely, you know, sunk Chile into this very dark history for a good, you know, five to eight years or so um, before eventually, you know, he was overthrown. But again, you know, this is a, a prime example of, you know, why, for example, many countries around the world are hesitant with you know, regime change or trying to, you know, the United States getting involved in that government. So I think, for example, if, you know, the best thing that I've heard, and this is something that I learned when I came to Canada, is that Pierre Trudeau went to China in 1970. Now, Pierre Trudeau is the father of the current prime minister, Justin Trudeau, here in Canada. And Pierre Trudeau went to China and he said, look, this is very interesting. I see China, a country, this is again, this is in 1970, 50 years ago. You know, I see you guys have a government that, you know, is very different than Canada. However, I see that you are doing good things for the people and that you are really going to begin a very big economic growth period because we're going to, you know, we, Canada and, and China are going to establish these diplomatic relations. The year later, 1971, Richard Nixon came in, did the same for the United States and China. Now, because of the foreign capital and investment, which China desperately needed, don't make no make no doubt about that. Um, that helped China really begin this economic growth. And again, 
you know, Canada, United States, everybody that established relations with China benefited as well. It was a two way street. Companies, you know, companies, citizens, governments, everybody was benefiting from these relationships. And Pierre Trudeau said, you know, we are never going to see eye to eye on politics. However, why don't we just decide not to discuss politics? Let's focus on trade. Let's focus on, you know, working together in areas that we can collaborate in. And, and that's something that I really want, you know, people to understand. And that's something from a Chinese perspective. You know, we, we need to, as Americans, you know, if, if we can't be culturally insensitive and come to China and say, you need to do everything the American way, that's just not going to happen. And I think it's the same thing. You know, China can't come to the America and say, you know, you guys should actually do it our way. You know, our way has been proven, you know, very good. I think what's really interesting is, is when we get into the nuts and bolts you know, democracy, is it a good form of government? Yes, there's many case examples that democracy has proven, you know, very effective. But there's also really an interesting trend is, is that, you know, the term socialism, even communism is gaining traction inside of America. Um, and, I'm, and, and I'm saying gaining traction, mean, it's becoming more popular. I mean, I think um, I want to be, you know, it's not like it's overwhelming majority. I mean, more people are interested in, 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 in this kind of socialist concept. And this is something that we see in America. You know, for example, um, what is the difference between China coming out and saying companies like Alibaba and Tencent are making way too much money? What they need to do is this common prosperity. They need to be giving back to society. They also need to be making sure that everybody, you know, has a fair chance. Now, in America, we all actually see the same thing happening. We see people saying, well, it's not fair that Jeff Bezos has $200 million. It's not fair that, or sorry, $200 billion, correction. It's not fair that Jeff Bezos then goes and buys a New York City penthouse for $100 million. Why does he have that money? Defund the billionaires, you know, uh, I mean, and look at like Bernie Sanders, you know, everybody, college education should be free. The government should pay for that. Everybody should be equal. You know, these are some things that are gaining traction in the United States, which is something that is, you know, happening in China as well. You know, these are concepts that, you know, for example, are very popular around the world. Again, I live in Canada. In Canada, we have socialized medicine. Now, you know, for an American to even hear that term, socialized medicine, for many people, they're like, no, like that's that's communism. You know, you can't have socialized medicine. And, and that is something that we see, um, you know, medical coverage. You know, I don't pay a single penny for having any type of medical needs that I have. As an American citizen, when I travel back, I'm here in America for the month of December. I have purchased travel insurance, you know, health insurance for while I'm America because, you know, I, I'm uninsured here, you know, unless I have that travel insurance because we don't have a system that rewards or takes care of our um, local, you know, citizens here. You know, you have to have insurance. You know, medical coverage is not free in America. There's tens of millions of Americans that have zero medical coverage. Uh, sorry, health insurance. They have zero health insurance. So if they do have a medical problem, um, you know, they're going to have to pay out of pocket. And as we know, you know, the United States healthcare system is extremely um, expensive. You know, and that could really put people in a very financial, big, very big financial difficulty. Now, um, I'm kind of uh, kind of going all over the place here. I'm, I'm kind of I'm really excited. You know, it's been a long time since um, you know we have had a live stream. So I just want to uh, you know again say thank you to everybody. We just saw a super chat come in. I want to say thank you so much. It is in Canadian dollars. So fellow uh, support from Edmonton, Alberta. Fantastic. Love Edmonton. Actually, I've been to Edmonton. Love Alberta. I have been to Calgary. I haven't been to Edmonton yet. Um, I'm a little bit cold. Don't let the background destroy you or not, don't let the background image behind me fool you. Uh, I'm not a big fan of cold weather. I'm originally from Florida. I like the hot weather. So I'm going to make sure I go visit Edmonton in the summertime. Um, but let me just go ahead and check some of the um, um, some of the comments here. And this is this is so interesting. Um, Americans hate socialism for uh, uh, for average Americans. And I think I think what's interesting about America is and I'm going to make some videos about America while I'm here. Because I want everybody to be clear, there's a lot of good stuff in America. I mean, America is a fantastic country. And at the end of the day, I'm American. I mean, this is my hometown. I, I grew up in Orlando, Florida. I'm back in my hometown for the first time in four years. But I'm also, 
um, you know, I'm back in the town that I grew up in. You know, it feels good. Home is always home. You know, it, it feels good to be back. And, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, I really enjoy when I come back to America. Um, you know, but it is really interesting to observe as well. And I'm going to dive into more details about, um, you know, American culture and kind of the difference in our government. But again, you know, again, like somebody comes in here and says Canada is more like communist country than China. You know, I think Canada, when we look at it, um, it's a very different form of democracy. And that's something that people need to understand. Um, you know, the democracy that we have in Canada is very different than the democracy that we have in America, you know, very different systems. And I think that's what's really important is that, um, you know, that there, there needs to be, um, every country needs to find a system that really works for them. I think that's really important. And I know that China's system is not, I would not say that it's an ideal system that we should be copying and, and kind of pasting around the world. I would not like to see the, the you know, the Chinese socialism, you know, socialism with Chinese characteristics be, you know, spread around the world. Because again, it's socialism with Chinese characteristics, which means that it's really meant for Chinese society and that works for China. Again, I mean, we've seen China, you know, they've had 70 years of stability here, you know, you know, since 1949, 70, 72 years of stability and growth. Obviously, within that time frame, there were some very difficult times as well. I'm not going to overshadow some of the mistakes that Chairman Mao made. Um, you know, the Great Leap Forward, um, you know, the Cultural Revolution. These are very difficult times in China. Interesting enough, a few weeks ago, early November, the Chinese government came out and passed the resolution. And this is something that was really important for everybody to understand. I'm going to go ahead and address this as well in today's live stream because it's important for people to understand that Xi Jinping has really, you know, China's government made a resolution and they have basically given Xi Jinping status that they've only given to two other people in China's history. The first was in 1949 with Mao Zedong. And the second was in, I think, 1985 or maybe 81 with Deng Xiaoping. But now here we are and it is 2021 and it's Xi Jinping. What that basically does is that solidifies that moving forward, you know, Xi Jinping is going to be the ruler of China. I mean, he's going to be the president. He is going to be officially reelected for his third term in, uh, you know, from the central government that holds their internal elections. It's obviously not a popular vote, you know, across the country, but within the government structure that exists in China, you know, he will have his third term and he will begin that. But it very much, you know, there is no term limits in China, um, you know, moving forward, you know, the world is going to have to accept that Xi Jinping is going to be the leader of China and, you know, for a long time. I mean, he, I believe he's 68 years old, you know, how much longer will he go? He might have another 20 years, you know, as, as he's ruling. So, you know, we need, you know, what we need to understand is that the government, the people have said, you know, we are, you know, moving forward with Xi Jinping. You know, this is what is happening. You know, this is what the Communist Party has said. This is what, the, what we want the best, you know, for our country. And, you know, it's going to be interesting to see, because, again, I think a lot of the things that Xi Jinping has done in the past 12 months, especially, you know, this is something that we're going to have to zoom out and look more over the long term. You know, we're going to we're not going to be able to see, you know, the effects of this, um, you know, within a few months. This is really a long time. So going back to the diplomatic boycott here. Um, you know, I think that China, you know, I remember I said earlier in the stream that China came out and said, you guys weren't invited. Well, technically they were, because again, when you become the, the host city, you're obviously going to invite these people from around the world. In addition to that, I think that, you know, China has come out very strong and said, well, it doesn't matter if you're here or not, we're going to have a good time. We're basically going to, you know, you know, carry on with these Olympic Games. I do think there's some truth in that. Obviously, the, the Olympic Games will move forward. Um I, I want to share with everybody, I have a, a tweet here, though, and, and this is something that I think people will be really interested to see, because I don't think you, uh, this was actually, let me, um, here we go, here's a screenshot that I took, and I'm going to just load this up here, and I want to talk about this, because I shared my thoughts, and I had a lot of comments, and I thought this was quite an interesting one. So this is from John, uh, John Pabin, and he said, and, and what I had said initially, this is what I said, I said, you know, the United States is missing an opportunity to engage with China. 
and this will cause further divide and drive a further wedge between U.S. and China relations. And this is what John said. I thought this was really interesting. While I agree that this will drive a further wedge, 19 other countries also refused to sign the Olympic truce. With dozens more poised to boycott, the signal from the international community is clear. Perhaps this is the start of engagement since other channels have been exhausted. Now, I like that. I said, I like your optimism, John. I would definitely like to see more engagement. At the end of the day, we need to find a way to coexist and work together. So this is something that I, I wanted to share because I thought it was a really interesting one. You know, China does need to listen, you know, does need to realize, you know, there is a lot of um, people in the international community that are saying, look, you know, we're, we're going to move to do a diplomatic boycott of this. Um, this is something that I think China should pay attention to. And I think, for example, what I would like to see is, let's say that I was the United States government. You know, what I would like to do is I would say, you know what, let's go to Beijing and let's have those meetings with China's government. You know, let's go to Xinjiang. You know, I'd like to, I mean, imagine if Joe Biden, who has traveled extensively with Xi Jinping, you know, imagine if it's like, look, you know, I know that you have had a history of terrorist attacks. I know that you have had a history. I know that you have had these, you know, uh, re-education camps that exist in China as in Xinjiang as well. You know, we. I want to hear the full story from your perspective. You know, I want to hear what is going on. You know, I want to see. I mean, imagine if the United States came out and actually, you know, said, "Look, I'm coming to Beijing. I'm going to be. I'm going to meet you face to face." You know. Um, instead of saying, you know, instead of, for example, Michael Pompeo on his last day, you know, saying, you know what, we're going to go ahead and declare that a genocide. You know, there's not conclusive evidence. There is not um, really any evidence to suggest a, a genocide. Now, is there, you know, crimes against humanity? Is there potential human rights violations? Absolutely. There could potentially certainly be that realization. I'm not going to come out and say that, you know, Xinjiang is some perfect you know, province where everything's perfect there, you know, but this is what happens when you have an extreme amount of terrorism and, you know, there's, there needs to be an effort to clean this up. You know, has there been human right abuses? Potentially. Absolutely. And, and I want people to be very clear, you know, I am a hundred percent for human rights across the world. I mean, there was a devastating story that came out just yesterday. And this was that in Georgia, in the United States, in Georgia, a southern state, predominantly Republican, there was modern day slavery going on with farm workers that were basically being paid, vastly underpaid, something like 20 cents a, a bushel for whatever they picked in the field. And, you know, these these, you know, these farmers were manipulating workers. You know, this was happening in America's back door. You know, this is in this is in. Oh, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's really unbelievable for this to come out. In addition to that, you know, Republican happening and they decided to stay silent on this. They decided to hide that this was happening. You know, there is evil that exists around the world. Uh, no country is exempt from this. And it is very much the fact that, you know, that every country must work together in regards to, say, human rights. Interesting enough, Jimmy Carter, former president of the United States, came out and he was asked a question. What do you feel? Do you feel that the United States has the authority to talk to China about human right violations? And Jimmy Carter, our former president, who has also called America the most warlike nation in the world, given our very troubled past, um, you know, and again, conflicts around the world, said, look, from an American perspective, we don't have the authority. We can't talk to anybody about human rights based on our own history and based on what are what even things that are still happening in America today. Now, that being said, I really want people to understand that this is a really important point. Just because one country has human rights violations does not give the pass for another country to also do human rights violations, right? Uh, again, you know, you know, I mean, like, again, I mean, we, we, we see this happening around the world. In Canada, in British Columbia, the province that my family and I live in, this summer we had a terrible time for Canada where Canadians were protesting to cancel Canada Day. July 1st is Canada Day in, 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 in Canada. And they were saying cancel Canada Day because there were hundreds of indigenous children graves that were found in these, um, you know, missionary um, Catholic 
you know, buildings, you know, basically these these uh, schoolyards, you know, that were that were uh, basically, you know, all of these indigenous children were sent there and the Catholic Church committed a genocide. I mean, it's a horrible story. And, you know, this was kept under wraps for many years. Um, and, and again, so, you know, we've seen things around the world. So, again, Jimmy Carter comes out and he says, look, we don't have the authority, but it doesn't give the pass either. So what we need to do is we need to hold each other accountable. And so I think a great opportunity would be, for example, if we have, um, you know, if again, if we had that opportunity for an American diplomat to go to China and say, look, you know, there might be potential human right violations here. There might be potential human right violations back in America as well. We've just, we literally just discovered one yesterday in Georgia. So what we need to do is hold each other accountable. And you know what, France as well, and New Zealand, and Germany, and Australia, and Africa, you know, the continent of Africa, and other countries around the world. You know, we really need to make sure that human rights are being observed everywhere in the world. And that is really, really important. So again, you know, when I think when we come down to the end of it, I'm going to share some comments because I have, um, I, I, and this is really important. This is now that we've got, um, I think we've just passed over, we're coming up to 600 people on the stream, guys. You guys are amazing. Thank you for being here with me. Um, I've got a couple, uh, another super chat that came in here. Um, just want to say thank you guys for the support. This is from Brave74. Keep up the positive message and hope. I want to, I want to tell somebody, I want to tell everybody um, something really interesting because you know, when, um, well, actually, let me do this. Let me do this first. I have an article that I want to share. We're coming up on 600 people, and this is really important, okay? This is an article that was that came out today. France will not join insignificant boycott of the Beijing Olympics, says Marcon. Now, Marcon, of course, is the president of, of France, and he has come out, and he has said that this these diplomatic boycotts are insignificant. They're not going to make a, any real um, you know, impact on the Olympic Games. I said this earlier in the stream. At the end of the day, wherever country you're from, name the representative that went to Tokyo for the 2021, you know, Summer Olympics. I guarantee you, I'm American. I don't even know who went because again, they weren't featured there. You're looking at the athletes. We're looking at the stories. These are the important things that are happening in the Olympics. A diplomatic boycott is not going to get the result that you want. However, in that earlier tweet, you know, it could actually, I'm trying to take a negative and turn it into a positive. It could be, hey, you know what? We got enough people here. You know, maybe we can, you know, maybe all of the countries that boycott, maybe we can have set up something with China to have a discussion. At the end of the day, we always have to be engaging with China. We always have to be encouraging more dialogue. This is a big mission of my YouTube channel is encouraging that dialogue, encouraging more people to have these interactions, you know, because again, um, like I've said many times before, we have to find a way for the United States and China and other countries around the world. Now, let's jump into this article. OK, this is from this is from the article from France. I'll put this back on the on the screen here. But it says um, that that the president, Emmanuel Macron, said on Thursday that a move would be insignificant. However, the foreign minister has said that Paris was still seeking what you know, what a, the Euro European Union is doing on the issue. Now, this is a very interesting quote here. I'm going to bring this up. And this is, to be clear, you either have a complete boycott and not send the athletes, or you try to change things with useful actions, Marcon said at a news conference Thursday, adding that he was in favor of action that has a useful outcome. Now, this is basically my stance on the diplomatic boycott. And this kind of sums it up. I'm, I'm very much aligned with the French president in this. Again, I'm going to read that one more time. It's very important. You either have a complete boycott and not send the athletes or you try to change things with useful actions. Now, we know if there was a complete boycott of the Olympics, who's the biggest loser there? It's going to be the athletes themselves. That's not fair to our American athletes who have trained their butts off, you know, to get there to Beijing and hopefully win a medal for their country. That's not fair. Like in Canada, Canada, you know, we wait for the Winter Olympics, because hockey is so great, you know, because, you know, we have some amazing skiers, we have some amazing people that are training, you know, for this moment, we don't want to hurt these athletes. And, and this is what he says, again, you know, I'm in favor of action that has a useful outcome. So imagine that if the French president goes, and let's imagine that he's the only major European country that sends a diplomat there, that is going to give France a tremendous amount of leverage to really speak with China. Because at the end of the day, when you're doing meetings in China, there's a concept, as many of you know, of giving and receiving face. 
you know, if if you are, you know, again, if it, let's imagine that the French president is the only European leader that goes there, and he and he's and he and then he goes there and he says, look. I'm representing my country because I want to have engagement. I want to have dialogue. I want to have a positive outcome from physically coming here and showing my face here in the middle of a pandemic. That's going to get some respect from China's government. You know, Xi Jinping will meet with him. Xi Jinping has not met with really anybody, to be honest. Why is that? Because, you know, obviously the pandemic. Xi Jinping has not left China since the beginning of the pandemic. There is no timeline for him to meet anywhere. This is one of the issues, for example, where... Um, Again, you know, like President Biden, Xi Jinping, these two gentlemen have to be meeting with each other as the two most powerful countries in the world. U.S. and China got to be meeting on a regular basis. Um, I think even in this day of Zoom technologies, I don't see why that can't be happening every single month, to be honest. I'm, I'm much in favor of having more and more dialogue and, and talking about these. But I think this is an opportunity. You know, the Fr you know, uh, French president, I think he said a very important thing there. And I want to also um, talk a little bit about uh, some of the other comments here. And, and this is something that also de deserves some merit. And this is um, the French education and sports minister, Jean-Michel Blanquer, uh, warned against politicizing the issue. We need to be careful about the link between sport and politics. Sport is a world apart that needs to be protected from political interference. If not, things can get out of control and it could end up killing all of the competitions. Now, I'm going to say that I, I, I somewhat agree completely. I somewhat agree with that statement, and here's why: because at the end of the day, sports has always been political. I mean, we do have to establish that fact. Uh, I mean, you know, as an American, for example, a few years ago, Colin Kaepernick, very prominent NFL quarterback, you know, he started to kneel during the national anthem during the football games in America. Now, football is like a religion in America. American football is a huge sport. And every NFL team, you know, we have the stars and stripes. We have the flag. We have our military that's honored at almost every single game. And so a lot of people took issue with this. They're saying, hey, you do not disrespect the flag. You do not disrespect our military. You do not disrespect our country by kneeling during the games. And and, and they said, if you want to, hold a press conference on the Monday afternoon, and then you can go and have your speech. And, and Colin said, well, you know what? On Sunday, I've got 80,000 people that are looking at me. If I'm going to make a move, this is for me the time for me to do that. So I, I'm not, I'm not going to say that, you know, like, polit like in a perfect world, you know, politics and sport should be separate. You know, we could, you know, just have sport and just enjoy sport. But I do realize the fact that, you know, for example, if there are athletes that are, are going to be protesting, you know, we might see something where athletes protest there. Maybe they're going to have, a, you know, an opportunity. Maybe they're going to take that tape I and mean, they might be on stage and they might do that. You know, that is something that has happened throughout world history. That is something that happens in sport. And so, again, I think there is a healthy balance there, you know, that we, you know, ideally, you know, we don't want to get into this tit for tat. That's the thing that, for example, you know, we don't want to see. And that's something that United States and China does often. It's kind of this tit for tat. You know, you did this, so I'm going to retaliate and do the same thing, you know, to you. Grab some water. Um, interesting enough, for example, um, you know, China has come out and said, well, the United States is going to pay severely, you know, for um, doing this diplomatic boycott. Well, what is that going to look like? I mean, could it mean that in 2028, when Los Angeles hosts the Summer Olympics, that China, you know, does a diplomatic boycott. You know, I would, I wouldn't like to see that. I mean, again, I, I do believe that Xi Jinping will be the president of, of of China by in 2028. Still, I mean, I would like to see Xi Jinping in LA. I mean, I would hope, I hope that in seven years' time, or six years' time, you know, six and a half, whatever it is, I would hope that. United States and China relations can can have some significant improvement. That is kind of a very scary outlook when we're already saying, well, maybe is China going to boycott 2028? That means that we're going to have another seven years of worse relations with China and the United States. You know that, and then and, this, and and let's be honest. I mean, these past two years have been a wild whirlwind of just you know back and forth issues, back and forth issues. So. You know, again, I don't want to wait to that. I'm hoping that, you know, we can learn to work together and that we can work, you know, try to find these solutions. So, again, you know, I think this is really, really important that we really understand 
um, you know, the importance of, let's go back to that Olympic Charter. You know, the Olympic Charter is really trying to bring together countries around the world and really making sure that, you know, we're trying to achieve a better world by, by coming together. Now, I want to share, as we're, we're kind of coming to the end of the stream, and I have a really important announcement, and this is really big. So I want to thank every, all of you for coming here and, you know, spending an hour with me here tonight. It's been so much fun to be back on the live streams. Um, I'm going to announce a couple things that I've got coming up on the channel. And what I'm going to do is on December 15th, I have a really cool YouTube video coming out. It's actually going to be an event that is bringing together Chinese and Canadian athletes. I'm very excited about this event because, you know, we, we've been working with, you know, these athletes to get them together, you know, to, and, and essentially what we have is we have three Canadian downhill skiers that are going to be on a, on, a, on a video with three Chinese Olympic snowboarders. And what we're going to be doing, I'm going to be the host of this event, and we're going to be bringing together these, these six Olympic athletes. Uh, one of the Canadian athletes actually won a bronze medal in 2018 uh, in uh, Pyongyang, which is fantastic. You know, I mean, so we've got an Olympic medalist that's going to be attending, and, and, we, and this Olympic medalist has been to Beijing, has, has, you know, has, has seen some of the facilities there. I mean, he's really... Um, you know, a really great ambassador, um, you know, for, for the skiing sport and for Canada. And I had a chat with him a couple of days ago, kind of briefing him on our chat, you know, as we're getting ready for this event. And he's super excited. You know, he's so excited to share his Olympic story and what he hopes for in Beijing and, and you know, and to cheer his, you know, fellow Canadian skiers as they go. And what we're really hoping for, you know, what would this event look like if it's a successful event? Well, what we're looking for is we really want to see this cultural connection. You know, ideally, I'd love to see some Canadian athletes asking the Chinese athletes some questions, the Chinese athletes asking some Canadians some questions. And again, that is where we're seeing these, you know, these connections being made and we're seeing, you know, bridges being built and relationships being built. And you know what? It starts at, at it starts at the athlete level. You know, I, I, I like to say this a lot, but we are having, you know, the United States and China started by ping pong diplomacy. Our relationship, our formal relationship with the United States and China started because of a game of ping pong. Now, maybe we need something like winter sports diplomacy, you know, having these athletes come together, you know, and, and it'd be amazing if we could have, you know, these Olympic athletes come in and, you know, have a great show together and, you know, really just start to see some cultural exchanges happening there. Because at the end of the day, these athletes have trained their entire life. They are all in the same position. They want to represent their country. You know, I guarantee you every Chinese athlete is very proud to be Chinese. There's a lot of things for Chinese people to be proud of, of their country, much like America, much like Canada. You know, you are, you, where you are born in this world, you are naturally going to be very proud of that country and, and really represent you know, that country. And I think that is what, you know, is so beautiful about the Olympics. So uh, mark your calendars, December the 15th, approximately, let's call it 10 p.m. Eastern time is when that video is going to go out. And so I'm excited to be sharing that with you as well. And, you know, I have to be honest with you. Um, I, I actually contemplated scratching that event completely. I actually contemplated saying, you know what, maybe with these diplomatic boycotts, Maybe I shouldn't be doing this event. Maybe I shouldn't bring together Canadian athletes and Chinese athletes for a discussion. And then I thought to myself, that really goes against exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to bring together these countries. I'm trying to be that bridge. And in a world where we have so much negative news, what a great opportunity to really focus on, you know, these amazing stories that are going to be happening. <clears throat> and that's, that is what I'm really, and so anyways, I'm glad that I decided to go forward with this. We're going to move forward. It's going to be a great event and I'm really excited to share with you. Um, in addition to that, while I'm here in America, I'm going to be doing a few more live streams. So the next live stream that you're going to see is going to be uh, next Saturday. It's going to be the, what day is that? I think it's the 18th, Saturday, December 18th. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to be bringing in a former uh, I'm going to bring in a Vietnam War veteran, a Vietnam War veteran, and I want him to share his journey of being in Asia because he first went to Vietnam to fight the Vietnam War. And his next time, his next return trip to Asia was in 2007 when he went to China and he traveled through China. 
And I, I want to be very clear on who this guest is. The guest that's coming on my show for this live stream will be my father. So I'm really excited to share that because I'm inviting my dad to come on to the channel. And we're going to have a really fun show because I want him to share his impressions, you know, of what he was doing in Vietnam when he was fighting in the war. And then his journey, he traveled, he came to visit me in Shanghai in 2007. We went to Qingdao. We went to Beijing. After that, he came back again in 2010 for another visit to Shanghai when, when Shanghai was hosting the, um, uh, the World Expo. And then finally, he traveled back again, you know, with my mother in 2014 and had an opportunity to uh, visit Hong Kong. And, you know, we were living in Hong Kong at the time. So he has some really interesting perspective. And I want him to share his journey of, you know, being an older generation, you know, American and kind of his perceptions of China. You know, what was his perceptions before? What was his perceptions after he came to China? And I think it's going to be a really interesting, a really interesting video. So. Anyways, I want to thank you guys. We're coming up to an hour on the live stream. And what I want to do is I want to ask, answer some questions. So please let me, uh, I'm going to go through the, if you have any questions for me, we're going to spend five more minutes answering any question you like about anything. I'm happy to answer anything. And, you know, after that, we will, um, you know, we will end the stream. But I want to thank you guys for, again, being here today. You guys are fantastic. Um, you know, over 600 people on the live stream today. I'm back in the game on the YouTube live streams. I love doing these. Um, they, are, they are so good. Um, <clears throat> here we go. When the Olympic athlete, athletes re require to quarantine when they arrive in China. So no, Olympic athletes are exempt from quarantining as long as they're double vaxxed. Now, what's going to happen is, is that Olympic athletes will be flying into a very specific wing of the Beijing airport. They will be going on a specific athlete only bus and they will be transported to the Olympic Village, and they will be in essentially an Olympic bubble. So there will not be an opportunity for athletes to, for example, you know, um, go take some pictures on the Great Wall of China, go check out the Forbidden City, see anything in Beijing. Essentially, you're going to see Olympic athletes. They're going to fly in, go to the Olympic bubble, do their events, back to the bubble, and then after they're done, they're going to get on a plane and they're going to leave. That's that's the, the extent of what you're going to see for these athletes. That's a little bit unfortunate um, because obviously it'd be, it'd be great to explore different parts of this. Um, and I think, uh, you know, unfortunately it's COVID, you know, it's still, you know, uh, having that. I'm seeing a lot of interesting things about Taiwan here. And I'm going to make it, I'm going to make a, a, a video about this. I'm going to make a dedicated video about Taiwan. Many people ask, you know, is Taiwan a country? Is it a, is it a part of China? I mean, I think uh, this is a really interesting video that we can make, you know, to kind of clarify the air on that. And I think what I want to do is I want to talk about Taiwan and really give everybody a very non-biased, very realistic look into Taiwan and what I feel for the future. I've got some interesting perspectives. I guarantee that you have never heard before about Taiwan. And, and I think it would just kind of bring us a little bit of reality here. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of people in the chat saying I am from Taiwan. Taiwan is part of China. Um, invite Charles Liu, a Taiwanese venture capitalist. We should be thanking the athletes best taken care of in China. <clears throat> Abs absolutely. Um, you know, we're wishing the athletes the best. I mean, we got to, again, this is the Olympics, guys. I mean, this is an amazing event. Um, and, you know, let's again, let's hope that uh, the athletes have a good time there, do the best. And any further questions? Anybody else want to mention anything else? Um, a, lot of a lot of questions about Taiwan. I will be making a video about that. It'll be good. Let's see. Just going through our comments here. American government need to take care of American people first, not the government game. I agree with that. We, I, I think um, I tweeted this out earlier this week. The best foreign policy for the United States is a domestic policy. We need to make sure that our country is a shining light for the world. We always think we are. We always think, hey, you know, everybody in the world looks up to America as the number one country in the world. That's kind of what we're taught growing up as an American. And I think for many years that probably was true. But I know in the last five years specifically, I, I know, for example, that, you know, many people on the international stage have had, you know, their their feelings towards America. I've lived in Canada for the last five years, and I know I can speak firsthand. Many Canadians are thinking much less and less of America, just more disappointed. You know, like you guys are really declining. You know, you don't have that stability that we 
expect. You know, you guys need to do better. Uh, that's the very real thing. You know, from you know that that is happening around the world. Um, and you know, we're going to talk more about that. Where can the events be seen online if our TV stations won't cover the games? I'm pretty sure that the government. I mean, at the end of the day, you're going to have American athletes there. You're going to have American corporations sponsoring. You're going to have. I mean, this is it's the Olympics. They're going to definitely be on the television. You know, there's no, no doubt about that. December 18th is a big day for Neo. Absolutely. Neo Day. That's true. Very true. Very true. Um, Angelo, if you're still in the chat, Giuliano, good to see you, buddy. Um, that is fantastic. Perfect. Well, guys, I want to thank you all. I, um, I don't, let me scroll down to the bottom. I don't think that we've seen um, anything. Again, more people talking about, do you have a favorite winter Olympic sport? There we go. That's a good question. Um, my favorite Olympic sport is definitely um, the couple's figure skating, I think is really beautiful. And I, I love I love watching these couples. I think they're amazing athletes. Um, and then really the bobsled. I think the bobsled is so fun. I think that's a really, a, really a cool one as well. So um, thank you, Hang. P please press the like button for Cyrus. That'd be great, guys, if you can smash that like button. Um, and if you could certainly drop me a comment down below, every like that you drop, every comment, it does help the algorithm, helps get this video out. And I really appreciate it. And just had a, um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, from Pecan, you know, thank you for the uh, nice work, Cyrus. Fair and transparent, no double standards, win-win for all. I, I try to base everything on facts and logic. Look, not everything I'm going to say is going to agree with the United States. Not everything I say, I, I think if you look at the content that I push out, Everything that I push out, China's not going to agree with everything I say. America's not going to agree with everything I say. And that's probably where we need to be. We probably need to be in the middle. And again, giving and taking a bit from both countries. Um, you know, I don't think America is 100% right on China. I don't think China is 100% right on America. There's got to be some give and take. And there's got to be, um, you know, there's got to be some working together. So, um, um Kok Chow. There we go. So, uh, yeah, Cyrus, how did you choose your Chinese name? So this is a really good one. This is a good story. So my Chinese name uh, comes from my wife. Uh, my wife, um, you know, her last name is Wong. So that is the same Wong, San Hung the Wong. Um, and then, you know, and actually my my original Chinese name when I moved to China was Sai Rei Si, Bi Sai De Sai Rei Si De Rei Si Da Ling De Si. And, you know, when you hear that name, Sai Rei Si, it's not a very good Chinese name. It's obviously a transliteration of my English name. And so uh, people were like, you know, a lot of Chinese people is like, oh, this name is very difficult. You should have a more Chinese name. You know, so, um, you know, I, I, when, I, when, I, when my wife and I got married, she's like, hey, you know, why don't you be a Wong? You know, you can be like one of our family. And then German, you know, Doug, what that does, because my mother's from Germany, I'm half German, I'm a dual citizen with the United States and Germany. So happy to represent Germany as the second character. And then, you know, I do have a heart for China. You know, I really do love the country of China. I love the people. I love the culture. And I really love the, you know, my experiences of being there for 10 years. It's, it really has changed my life. It, it is very, very grateful for the 10 years that I lived in China. So I'm very honored to have that third character represent China. So that is... That is my uh, Chinese name, Wang Gajong. Um, yeah, make a video on Taiwan, Cyrus. I want to see your view on that. How will you make that sound like a good thing? We know you're paid by China to shed light on them in a good way. I already know your answer. Well, I'm not paid by China, and you can watch my videos that you know to that um, you know that say that 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 clearly you know outline exactly you know how this channel is monetized. And, um, you know, I know that maybe you haven't watched those videos yet. So I, I, I would encourage you to look back at my videos and I address all of those um, issues. The, the key thing here, guys, is that I'm an independent content creator. And how am I going to address the Taiwanese issue? The facts and logic. You know, the very simple fact, um, for example, you know, when we look at is Taiwan a country, um, the very simple thing. I mean, I'm an American citizen. What does my United States government say about Taiwan? What does the United Nations say about Taiwan? These are important facts. I mean, again, this is not a bias. This is not, this is not something even coming from China's government. This is coming from every major government in the world today as far as who they recognize. That is a fact that needs to be brought to the table. Now, I am going to address, for example, you know, the, the title of my Taiwanese video is going to be, for example, you know, the truth about Taiwan, does World War III start here? 
And this is really important because this is where a lot of people are saying, you know, if there's a conflict between the United States and China, it's going to happen in Taiwan. And I have some interesting perspectives that I want to bring to the table here. I'm going to save some for the video. So I know there's a lot of interest in that. I'm going to save some for the table uh, for that video. And that is something that I want people to wait and see. Because, um, again, I think that, that we really need to listen to a lot of the Taiwanese people. Um, you know, there's a large portion. Uh, there's, there's, many, there's some people in Taiwan that definitely want independence. There's some people in Taiwan that definitely want a closer relationship with China. There's some, many, people, many people in Taiwan that want the status quo. These are all things that we, you know, facts that we need to address and, you know, also look at some history. So we're going to make a good video about Taiwan. And I'm going to tell you what my goal, what I would like to see happen with Taiwan. Um, and we're, we're going to address that in the future. So anyways, guys, thank you guys for all of your amazing um, support. <laughs> That's funny. Roughneck77. Seven, seven. I, I, I'm an Asian American and I'm confused about Taiwan and China. A lot of people are. It is, um, you know, uh, you know, here we go. 47% want reunification. That's a big statistic. Um, looking forward to it. Cyrus from Quok. Thank you so much. Thank you for the support. Quok. I know you're a Patreon supporter as well. So I appreciate you being a Patreon supporter, my friend. Um, and I love seeing you in this chat. I appreciate all your support. Shout out to all my Patreon supporters who have jumped in the stream Thank you guys for being a part of, of uh, my team, you know, and really getting behind me and to support this. I, I've got some fun videos that are coming out. Oh, I do have one more thing. I'm going to give you a preview. My next video, guys, is going to be, this is the thumbnail. From NBA China to real estate mogul. This is a really fun story. I, I'm really excited to share this. Um, this is the story of Sam Coleman who is an American basketball player. He was an American professional basketball player, had a chance to go to China, played in China, has played around the world. And what I'm doing here in this video is, this is really exciting, is I'm sharing a very inspirational and a very motivating story because Sam tells his story how he went to China, pursued his professional basketball career, had an opportunity to go to the NBA, you know, had it cut short, and then really experienced some hardship in his life. You know, he was down to his last dollars. He was driving Uber to, you know, survive. And he tells, you know, and, he, and what it was really interesting was, is I, I wanted him to share his experiences in China. What did he learn when he was there? And it was a really cool story. It's about 20 minutes long. It's not too long. It's a good story. And anyway, Sam and I sit down for a fantastic interview. That's going to be coming out tomorrow night on the channel. So that'll be the next video that you guys will see. So happy that I remembered to bring that one up. And anyways, guys, that's it for me tonight. I want to wish you all a fantastic, um, you know, rest of your, um, you know, weekend ahead. Thanks for spending, thanks for kicking off the weekend with me here on YouTube. And uh, make sure you hit your like, uh, subscribe to the channel if you're not already, and drop me a comment down below. Thanks, guys. We will see you all in tomorrow's video.